he, he said, well, this looks like it should have been written in Quran, and it's really bad in terms of doing it. So basically, in terms of your experiences, uh, the main thing of this point is don't get discouraged because everybody goes through this. It's very difficult to write a paper. It's very difficult to, to conceptualize what should be in a paper. But then it takes a while. And it took me probably 15, 20 papers before it became much more natural. But still, even now, some of the papers I write on area things that I'm pretty bored with, I will, in fact, uh, I, I just, uh, it's really tough for me to do. Okay, now, um, how do you get, why do you want to get a, 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 a large number of publications? Um, the chances you get cited on Oh yeah, basically the, the people, who, the more pa the more papers you write, the more likelihood of you being cited than the, the cited about them. But what else? It establishes you as an expert for grants. Yeah, it establishes. It's very interesting how this works. Is the more you publish, the more likelihood it is for you to get a grant, and the more likelihood if you get a grant, the more likely you'll publish. So this is a continuing evolution for people that basically if you don't get a grant within the first five or six or seven, eight years, it's very difficult for you to get a grant. But it's basically, it's, it's called uh, it's something like the, the law of, uh, of accumulation in terms of quality. So that basically the, what will happen is this separates out people where you find some people going out publishing, get a lot of grants, publishing, get a lot of grants, and other people just dribble along with not, not very many publications and not very many grants. And so the person that goes up high. But what else do you, why do you want to publish? Share plans Yeah, exactly right. That's how, it's very interesting what you, what you said. And because this is, and I'll tell you a little bit more about of the philosophies that, that we've been developing, is that when grants, when articles and publications originally began, they began to basically inform other scientists. That was the sole purpose of this. Now, what are publications used for now? To find something new. Exchange your ideas. To find something new, to exchange ideas. Also to validate some money issues, like pharmaceutical companies. Okay, for val validation. But the recognition. Exactly right, recognition. The, the publications in academia are the currency of academia. So the more you publish, the more currency you have, the more grants you get, the more, more committees you don't have to be on, the more teaching you don't have to be on, and it's a, a process, and that's why it's really so important to publish. You'll see that towards the end of the lecture, one of the areas we've been developing quite a bit is the future of biomedical publications or where it's going, and we want to actually bring it back to the primary purpose of communication among scientists and take away from take away this issue of prestige, etc. Okay, the next question is how do you get a lot of publications? Okay, well, get a lot of data. I mean, data are extremely important. You need the data to publish. How else? Uh, through a team work, because often I see uh, a lot of the same authors, like five or six of the yeah. same authors published. So I assume one of them writes the paper, but uh, one person gets five out of this published. So That's exactly, exactly right. Basically, if you want to get a lot of publications, get a lot of friends and work on the same project. <laughs> so for example, to me, I, I, I like friends. Uh, uh, Tom is a really good friend of mine. Jan is a really, really good friend of mine. And basically, what we did in the, in the early 90s, and Eugene too, we basically, there was a core of us around the world that were writing papers together. And in one year, I think we had like 35 to 40 publications. And so you get on the team, and basically, you, you're not necessarily the first author all the time, but I, I, I figured it out very early in my career. I could write like six first author papers myself, or I could be a part of a group and publish 20 papers. So, uh, and basically, so if you're part of a team, it's, all, it's very, very beneficial. And basically, the team will help you get publications, the team will help you, help you get uh, uh, not only publications, the team will help you to, to get promoted. Okay, now what I wanted to do is to give you some idea too, is because one of the things that impressed me today in talking with all of you is what type of projects that you're developing. Now, how many of you are working on projects or planning to work on projects about a specific disease? Okay, most of you. That's, that's very good, that's very good. 
Now, how many of you know the incidence or prevalence of the, that disease in your country? A relatively small number, much much smaller number. And the reality is that if you, uh, one of the things I've seen for Kazakhstan and also Uzbekistan, uh, uh, Tajikistan, is that uh, there often is not enough data on these things. And uh, I can tell you, my claim to fame is 14.2. That's my claim. I know this. 14.2 is my number. Don't let anybody steal that number. That's my number. And the reason that that's my claim to fame is that we were doing something in Pittsburgh is that similar to what you have in stroke, we were setting up a registry for childhood diabetes. There was no data in the United States on the incidence of childhood diabetes. We set up the registry and the incidence of type 1 diabetes is 14.2 per 100,000. This number is used in every article. And you can do that for your work, too. We're talking about orphans here, or orphans in Kazakhstan. Really fascinating issue. And what is the incidence of orphans in Kazakhstan? I don't know. No, I have no idea. So think about your disease, your entity. If you generate that number, that's extremely important. And that's going to be referenced forever, because you've got the first data on this in Kazakhstan. And so these are data that will make, that really push, the, push things forward in order to understand the incidence of, uh, of disease in these areas. And I, said, I think that's something that you really must want to do. And the other thing for this is that um, the presentation today was, was very good uh, by, by Charles. And um, one of the things we're doing, did you, did, you, did you talk about the Central Asia data? Uh, not yet. Oh, are you, are you going to do that? Yes. Okay, well, Eugene's going to talk with you about this tomorrow. And basically what we're doing is the data are so poor in Central Asia, well, why can't we just get standardized data from, from all of you to basically bring that into a single site to, in order to get good data for the first time on incidence and prevalence of disease in this area? So, so if you want to become famous, Get, uh, get the incidence of uh, 10.4 per 100,000 orphans in, in Kazakhstan. These are really simple numbers. And the other aspect is I think two of my major cited papers were this number, and then we estimated from our data, from the incidence and prevalence data in the United States, how many people have insulin-dependent diabetes. Well, nobody knew. We had the best data. And so everybody uses this number as part of our articles. Are, there are 150,000 people with type 1 diabetes in, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the United States. And so these are really simple questions. And in fact, these simple questions with these simple numbers are some of the most powerful numbers that are there. Okay. Uh, let's see. Oh, that. Okay. Now what I'm going to do for you is to give you some hints about how to get published in the uh, epidemiologic literature, the clinical literature, and basically how to play the game of publication. Well, what we've seen, and this is, this is a great quote, is without publication, science is dead. So when we started out publications, it was about only about 150 years ago. Basically, the idea was that the, we, we have to communicate our scientific findings to other scientists and to people around the world. And, and now, we're in a, now we're in a revolutionary age, which I'm going to be talking about a little bit later, with the internet and mobile technology, which is really changing very dramatically how we approach publications. And it's not settled yet, but we need to begin to put our arms around these approaches, these internet-based approaches. What I'm going to talk today is about the types of articles, Impact factors, targeting journals, uh, uh, what publishers want, uh, criteria used by editors, uh, key features of well-written articles, uh, and the writing process itself, and why articles get rejected, and also the future of biomedical publications. 
Now, there's several different types of articles. The referee conference procedures, referee journal articles, uh, review articles, and uh, letters. Now, what do you think is viewed as the best? Uh, the second one? Yeah, second one. The, the referee journal articles. And it's really funny, though, because um, uh, what, what do you think is the definition of a peer-reviewed journal? Um, well, well, let's take somebody else. What is a peer-reviewed journal? We always talk about peer-reviewed journals, but, but what is a peer-reviewed journal? <laughs> Okay, so experts on the journal, and what did these experts do? Okay, they review the articles. Very interesting. Yeah, it's very straightforward what a peer-reviewed journal is. But what's amazing is the, uh, the, the uh, definition of a peer-reviewed journal by the head journal group is that 51% of the articles in a journal, if you have 51%, you have a peer-reviewed journal. So what you see in some of the top journals, an amazing concept that, uh, for example, we, we have an article about nature, nature saying that nature is turning away from being a scientific journal and becoming a magazine. Because only 15% of the articles in nature are reviewed. So it's like, it's, this is sort of like this strange concept of peer review when uh, they're really not peer reviewed. But at the same time, in order for you to get public, in order to get, for you to get it to tenure, you have to publish in a peer-reviewed journal. Now, this is kind of weird. If I publish in Nature, everyone's going to be really happy with me publishing in Nature, despite the fact it's not a peer-reviewed journal. Or if I publish in the American Journal of Epidemiology, where everything is peer-reviewed, well, most people would want to be in Nature than the American Journal of Epidemiology. So, you have this system of uh, peer review. The reason that Nature and Science and New England Journal of Medicine uh, approach this a little bit differently is that, that they get, and the British Medical Journal, the British Medical Journal gets 200,000 articles a year. Incredible amount number, the, the largest number of submitted articles there. And what they do is when you submit an article to the New England Journal of Medicine, to, to the BMJ, you send it in, and what you have is a PhD in astronomy deciding whether, vetting that, and deciding whether it should be published or not. Uh, what's the problem with this? I'm biased. Yeah, why is it biased? Special uh, why did you say it was Because that's the person who's there. I'm sorry, I, I, I just, it's not like I picked it out of the air. There's a PhD in astronomy that's vetting the articles, who's on the editorial board. What? Yeah, exactly right. Basically, when you talk about a peer-reviewed journal, uh, where's the peer in the system? You have an astronomer looking at your work. I mean, geez, I, I'm a physicist. Well, and so they vet, and they cut out 90% of the articles by this one person. And A, the, the major point is, A, this is not a peer. B, when you're setting up a peer review system, the reviewers should not be on the editorial board. And so, uh, so this whole system is getting a little bit squishy now in terms of peer review. And, and, and also the problem is that nobody really wants to review, review articles anymore. Why don't you think people want to review articles anymore? Takes so much time. Takes so much time, but what else? It's free. What? It's free. Yeah. It's free, yeah. Hey, I, and because people, we, we used to think, oh, well, the Lancet, the BMJ, they're so poor. And then you look at the Lancet for Elsevier Press. If I would have put like $10,000 into Elsevier Press 20 years ago, I'd be a millionaire now. So why should we, I mean, I hate to say it, why should we support the system where, where a system where we get the money to do the research, we take that money to the research, we collect the data, 
analyze the data, and then we say, and so maybe each one of my, my articles are maybe $10,000 each, I say, oh, here, Lancet, here's my article. You can use it to make as much money you want off of it. So it's like, ah, oh, there's something wrong with the system, and a lot of people are, are and I'll show you, show you how people are, are starting to think about it, is that now, for example, if you send an article out for peer review, if you go for a top journal, you, typically the editors will need to send it out to 10 different people with the hope of getting one to review it. Because for me to review an article, to do it right, it takes me three hours, three hours of free time to do that. Well, I do review articles, but, but, but basically I do review articles for my friends because basically these are the, and, and, but I try to avoid it because it can take so much time. It doesn't even voice these Oh, everyone says it. Basically, basically, but the, um, the, every, a lot, everybody's voicing it. Well, what is the, what is the power of the journals? They have total control. Journals, if you look at it, have a monopoly. And so, uh, oh geez, here's a monopoly here. Uh, how can you fight a monopoly? How can we fight a monopoly? And, and, and we can't. And well, there's ways that we're working to do this. So basically, it's a very interesting perspective, uh, and I'll be going, going through this a little bit, and how this is part of the changes of the systems that are occurring right now, because scientists are all upset, uh, and, and, and basically, and the journals, what happens every year to the journal subscriptions here at NU? Oh, yeah, we, we see basically, basically the increase goes up like 10, 15% a year for these, for these journal articles, it's really incredible. A very interesting story is that, uh, do, do you all know who Rupert Murdoch is? Mm -hmm. You know who Rupert Murdoch is? Rupert Murdoch started to get his money in scientific publication because he saw this is a no-lose situation. No, because this is no-lose. We can just continue to increase the, the, the cost of these journals and no one can say no. So it's very interesting. Okay, let me take you through these. Um, so these, uh, the types of journals are, there are the generalists and the, the specialist journals. What do you think a generalist journal is? Like the Okay, well, what? what? <laughs> somebody else, somebody else. Okay, let, let's say every fourth question you can answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, but uh, we need to give some other people a turn. Okay, now, so basically, so what's a generalist journal? Yeah, basically, uh, and so what type of journal would that be? Basically, and I, a journal that has a broad range of features. Science, Science nature, uh, nature medicine, uh, New England Journal of Medicine. These are the broad journals. And these are the journals that have the biggest impact. And uh, would you like, which journal would you like to publish in? The American Journal of Epidemiology or Science? Oh, very good. You got that right. Everyone passes. Yeah. So basically, basically, this is the journal that everybody wants. These are the journals that everybody wants to get in. And me too. I've been in most of those. But these are the ones who want to get in because of the prestige. Because you can go. You can basically say, Hey, uh, have you published in Science like I have? <laughs> these are and these are basically this. These are big, big time peer systems, that, and, and and also. You get your stuff seen because science, uh, because the British Medical Journal it goes out to 250,000 people a year. The American Journal of Epidemiology goes out to 5,000 people a year. So uh, you, you want to get in a high prestige journal. But well, what's the problem? How, what's the problem of getting into these journals? Uh, like what? You are not alone. Exactly right. You are not alone. The current, the current uh, acceptance rate for the British Medical Journal is 4%. So it's, I mean, you, it's really tough to get in. Uh, if you get in, it's really great. But wow, I mean, the, the odds are very much against you. Okay, that's science. Okay, now impact factor. Have you heard about impact factor? Yeah, I, I thought you know, we'll take you through this relatively quickly. Now, on the uh, basically, this is just a, the the person who, um, who who developed this is a friend of mine, Eugene Garfield. He's a, a brilliant man, and basically he developed this about 30 years ago. Everyone thought he was totally nuts. 
well, he, because he spent a year copying all these citations from the back of articles. Like, what do you do with this? What do you do with this? And all of a sudden he caught on and people became more and more interested in it. And you can use citation factors now to look at the, the, uh, the quote, the citation factors of your articles, of your of journals, of your universities. And basically this is becoming pretty universal. And basically the logic of this is very simple, is that if people reference you, then your stuff must be pretty good. So the more references to your work, then basically the more, more interest there is out, out there on, on the net. Now this is, is, is and basically what Fine and I have been looking at is an alternate way of doing this. And basically, uh, how, what, how does Google do this? Number of times they search. Nope. I mean, that's one way. That's not it. Number of downloads. Nope. What Google does is basically this is where Burns got all his money. It was a brilliant concept. It's what he took is what he took. They said, said, well, here's my site, the Superbook. Well, let's see who's looking at my Superbook. So it's looking at it's the people looking at the Superbook, and they give more credit to. Bigger places, like if you had McDonald's in in uh, in, in Rio, uh, who cares? But if you have the NIH looking at you, whoa, that's much much more apparent. And so what they developed is a system called uh, Google PageRanks, and this is starting to be used in academia also. So you should be familiar, begin to get familiar with it. And uh, the reason that this is important, these Google PageRanks is that it determines the order of the, the sites that are coming out in your, in, your, in your search. So one, two, so a Google page rank of one is the first thing on the site. Now why is it important? Uh, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> this, that, that wasn't the fourth time, let's go. <laughs> okay, okay, How, why is it important? Ding, 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 ding. The Google page rank. Hi, your article. Exactly right. Basically, if you have an article in the top ten or a site in the top ten, you're going to be seen. If you do look at the searches now, you see like a million sites out there. Well, if you have site number eight thousand eight hundred and ninety-two thousand, you're not going to be seen. So if I was trying to sell raincoats, basically, I want to be in the top ten. I don't want to be down in, in four hundred thousand. So the power of this is it shows the impact of the information on the web, a much broader sphere than uh, citations. And what we think is this is the way things are going to be going in the future for assessing the quality of the uh, the quality of lecture, or the good quality of uh, articles. Okay. So, so the the new value would be, yeah, that's what I'm asking then, that it would assign some value to each journal, and if you're cited in that journal, the number of citations would be no. weighted by the quality of the journal? Uh, no, no, no. The way it would be done is basically, it's, it would be done on an article basis. So if you were doing an article on your zebrafish, and I was doing my article on diabetes, we can d determine which has more of an impact on the web by the Google page ranks. So you can do it on journals too, but on a one-to-one -one basis, you and I can be compared because of, the, because of the, this as a measure. It's a measure of impact on the web, where this is impact on the journals. It's really cool. We've, we've been spending a lot of time analyzing data for that. Okay, the impact factor, as I said, impact factor uh, in many universities now, are being used for determining uh, advancement. And basically, so what will be done is there's a, uh, a, 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 a overall impact. And when you're coming up for, for tenure, um, the, there's a, a, something called an H factor. And an H factor is an overall assessment of the impact of your work. And so you'll be hearing more about this uh, in the future.
You develop more and more, um, let me say, uh, enemies. And these enemies will say, oh, man, this is wrong. And, and, and basically, you don't want to have that review your article. And so this is a way that you're not saying these are the people that are, these are the people who should be reviewing it. It's giving the editor an option, and it basically will, will give you a fairer chance. The, goal, the, the sole goal of this is not to play the game in terms of deviate the system. The goal is to get a fair chance. And if, if my articles are reviewed by Charlie, this, I'm not getting a fair chance. I mean, he's in a totally different field. And that's the usual thing that happens because the editors don't know what field you're in. Oh, now, okay, now, the, the current accepted rate is, for these major journals, about 10%. I've published a lot of papers as letters to the editor, and the, why, why, what is the advantage of publishing a letter to the editor? Diversity. Yeah, diversity. Basically, if I get a letter to the editor in Lancet, which reaches 250,000 people, I'm getting my message out. I don't care if, 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 I set, if I submit that as an article, I only have a 5% chance. So basically, and everyone reads the letters, actually more people read the letters than read the articles themselves. So, we, so uh, when you're thinking about developing something for publication, develop, I mean, basically uh, letters are very good to get the word out. Okay, the... Um, uh, Okay, see, so this is selecting your external reviewers. I would suggest uh, Dr. Dorman in Pittsburgh, Dr. Tomiento in Finland, and Dr. Tsujima in Japan as the reviewers. Okay, there are only two times I feel stressed, day and night. You'll find as you're, you'll, you'll find as you're an assistant professor, it's a mildly stressful situation. I mean, it's fun, but it, but it's a, it can be mildly stressful. The editor, you get this message, the editor and the editorial board consider the reviews and contact you to make a decision. Possible outcomes are rejection. Oh, God. <laughs> the tears. <laughs> you rejected the pain. And also, this, is, this isn't merely a rejection. It's a bloody execution. It's a sense you get in terms of when you start to get, when you first start doing and trying to get things articles published, I'm sure you had the same thing, Charlie. You know, first time you get that rejection, like, oh my God, my whole future is over. It's not. <laughs> okay, rejected. Uh, there's several things you can do uh, with a rejection. And um, the, the options are you can move to another journal, submit it to another journal. This is what I always do, because basically I figure if it's rejected uh, in, in this journal, I'm not going to have much chance of getting it in that journal. But other people actually take it back to the editor and basically write to the editor and have them re review it. Uh, as, as this thing says, good luck. I mean, the odds are not high at that point. Okay. Okay, you submitted a revised manuscript, that's good. Uh, I think out of about 500 articles I published, I've only had about 10 that haven't had comments that I didn't change. And you obtain an unqualified acceptance, it, 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 that doesn't happen. It's very rare. The beauty of the style and harmony and grace and good rhythm depend on simplicity. And basically, the, in terms of a clear, concise, and meaningful title which creates interest. Now, what's wrong with this article of title from a, uh, a, 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 a an epidemiologic journal? Well, well, what do you think of it? Well, um, this was my article. It's really embarrassing. I mean, basically, it's really, well, this was my article. It's really huge and embarrassing because all of a sudden I opened up this book on, on uh, how to write a, an article, and they go, there was a section in there on worst titles for articles, and I was there. Yeah, <laughs> huge and embarrassing. I'm quite proud of it. But I think, oh my God, it's just embarrassing. <laughs> And it, it became, geez, I like it at the time. Just, you know, basically, there's a whole front page. Why, why monkeys? Oh, basically, because what I had is, what I had, it was really cool. I had this uh, monitor, like now, like on an iPad, which monitored activity. And, and you could put the this monitor on monkeys, you could put it on weird kids, you could put it on everybody, like, measure the physical activity. <laughs> but, so, as you see, I will publish anything. 
Yeah, now, these are some of the things that, in terms of well-written articles, these are some of the things that, that I've, uh, I, I use now. Supergrowth to end error by selection, cunning birds, bees, and NCVs. Lancet likes really catchy terms. That was the only answer. And death of biomedical journals. Okay, it takes time to write articles, and I'm sure you know this too. When you're starting to write an article, uh, you, the, I have days that basically, uh, uh, and you will have days like this, that just complete blockage, that you, you just can't write. Well, and you look at it, you look at your computer screen and you look at it for eight hours straight, thinking, oh, <laughs> don't worry about it. You'll, you'll come out of it. I mean, this, this is, you, you will come out of it. And don't even try. Go to the refrigerator and start eating. That's what I was doing, <laughs> which is the problem and, and for me. So basically, and, but expect that. And sometimes some of my blocks have, they, they have stayed maybe two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. And, and it just, you just can't get anything relevant out. And all of a sudden, bing, you know, nothing you can do. Okay, in this office, everyone is treated with respect and dignity. Thank God we can still be ruined our computers. <laughs> okay, um, the, the, in terms of practical tips, the critical thing for you to learn how to write is to get a mentor. You can't learn how to write by yourself. So work with somebody who's published well, and look, and look for people. A lot of people are happy to help you. A lot of people are willing to do this in the internet, the internet now. But basically, what you want is somebody to read your stuff and give you feedback. The first article I ever wrote in my life, uh, the first out of 500, I went through 15 drafts. You've got to be better than that. But basically, it was just over and over and over because I didn't know how to write, and I hated to write. But basically, after that, so basically, you need someone to respond to you. You need a mentor who's going to work with you to write because it's almost impossible to, to do this by yourself. And then I'll finish up in just a couple of minutes. Manuscripts okay. containing individual references are more like this under of security than a market scholarship. I typically, in a lot of the articles, just reference, reference uh, review articles, especially if it's a big area. Oh, no, I'm not going to go through this. Okay, now, uh, I got involved with this because of the, the concept of the future of, uh, future, uh, this is me, the future of scientific <laughs> publication. Uh, I'm looking into the future, what's going to happen in the future. And basically, what, what is changing scientific publication? Open sourcing. Open sourcing is one thing. What else? E-journals. Uh, E-journals, e yes. What else? More discovery. More discovery, lots more. The biggest change for journals is the internet. The internet. Now, what we've been arguing, and I'll show you what we've been arguing, the, and what we've been arguing is it's going to change things so much, our whole concept of journals will change. So that there won't be a journal in five years, there won't be a journal in six years. And what happened is that uh, we wrote an article in, um, 19, in about, about uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and published in the British Medical Journal. It was called The Death of Biomedical Journals. Now, who do you think disliked this? The journal. The journal hated it. Oh, God. It was a, but they published it. British Medical Journal. So and everyone, everyone went to the British medical school, what are you doing? This is really crazy. And basically, the journal editors hated me. I went to one meeting in Prague where I presented this, and uh, I was presenting first at like from 8.30 to 9 o'clock in the morning. From 9 o'clock till 9.30 in the morning was the editor of the Lancet. From 9.30 until 10 o'clock was the editor of New England Journal Medicine. From 11 o'clock to 11.30 was the head editor of Science. From 11.30 to 12 o'clock was the head editor of Nature. And it was one of the most phenomenally fantastic days of my life because every one of them said, Ram Lapore, you're an idiot! Oh God, you said love it. You figure when you get all the journal editors mad at you, uh, you gotta be doing something right. 
Well, the reason that they did something right is that this, this article was published in the British Medical Journal. And uh, unbeknownst to me is that they slipped a figure into this article. And this, this figure caused an incredible uproar. And you'll see why. I didn't even know it was in there. And I mean, basically, all the journal was so mad with mad with us. I love it. I love it. And this is the figure. Nope, that's not it. This is the figure. Isn't that a boxes? <laughs> And so basically, they, so they, they put that in, as, I thought it was a wonderful figure, because that's exactly what we're saying to do. His basic argument is that in this era of the internet, why do we even need journals? And what, what was talked about before is the core of what we want to do in scientific communication is to communicate with other scientists. Well, why do we need this intermediary group of people? Why, why do we need this journal? Well, basically, I can put up something on the web that's better than what's in the journal, and you can read it here in Kazakhstan. Uh, for free. For free. For free. So basically, the argument we're doing is that, that the internet will solve this and be a change. We're, we're getting a change in science where uh, basically we can send, send things out. Um, and let me use the, use the one example of this. Okay, now uh, here's Wikipedia, and this is basically, you can get now some best science out of Wikipedia. I mean, I mean, well, this, basically, this is better than science, it's better than nature. And what we found is YouTube now is some very, very good science being produced in YouTube. There's a lot more, Hans Rosling, which we were talking about earlier, who has a phenomenal YouTube demonstration of, 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 of data, it, it is incredible. And we're seeing more and more data. And uh, what we've been doing is with the super course, one of the things that we discovered is like, okay, one of our lectures that we had on H1N1, uh, if I would have published that in the American Journal of Epidemiology as an article, 5,000 people would see it. This one lecture was seen by 50 million people. Well, if my goal is to communicate science to people, well, uh, we're, I mean, I mean, we're, we're reaching thousands of times people more. And so what we're seeing is the journals are trying to hold on for, for, the, for the reason of money. There's no question about it. But the science is changing. That's why you as young people should think about this. How the science is changing and how you can be a part of this. Publications are very important now and with the old school, but in five or ten years, they're not going to be important, and then we'll have a new school going on. Yeah, I think that be the thing. Okay, any questions? <coughs> yes, sir. How are you going to control the standards of the law? Throw money. I mean, this applause sucks. Just throw money. What? Now my question is, how are you going to control the quality of those articles that will be published in the open sources? Finally, you want to answer this question? How do we control quality? Uh, open source journals or just So first, easy uh, part. So, so for open source journals right now, they have the same peer review that they have for regular journals. So, um, uh, but for things uh, like we do in the super course where anybody can use their lectures free of charge, we do multiple things. And one of them is a five star system. So similar to like online stores. So I don't know if you can with Amazon or things of that Okay, so like for example, uh, anybody can review it. So instead of relying on experts, you're relying on people who are users of the lecture to review it, similar to what they do in uh, online stores. So if something gets five stars, it's a good quality. If something gets three stars, it's medium quality, and one star is a bad quality. So it's very simplistic, but it worked well for online products. We tried it with the super course, it worked quite well. <coughs> so lectures with Nobel Prize awards got fives, and lectures for me got fours and threes, and, and so on and so forth. So this is one of the ways. Uh, uh, another thing is you can, uh, chart, uh, you can judge the quality of some of the materials by uh, looking at who they came from. So if something is published by a professor in Harvard, it probably is better quality than something published from uh, less than a school or community college. So, so there are multiple ways that we can talk about them. You know,
to dominate this answering question in this discussion. All right, so everybody wants to eat, uh, right? Anyone? Okay, uh, I think because I gave you this lecture, I expect to be an author at every one of the papers. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to make a quick announcement that we're talking about, but uh, I'll be talking about uh, our new Central Asian Internal Global Health tomorrow. So and during that lecture, I plan it as a more of a question and answer seminar versus just me lecturing. So I think I'll be able to uh, discuss a lot of things related to scientific publishing when we talk about the situation of global health. So save some of your questions tomorrow because I really want you guys to be active.